Hello, my lovely witches. Welcome to episode 53 of C3 Crystals, Cauldrons, and Cocktails. Sorry for missing last week. It's been a little overwhelming with the end of school coming up. Uh, my kids, all that kind of stuff, work stuff going on. It's been crazy. So I, I couldn't I couldn't get to it. Um, I, I was able to go to the Renaissance Festival this last weekend with Ren. So we had a little bit of downtime to kind of, you know, cool our little brains off a little bit. And it was it was fun. It was good to blow off some steam. We dressed up and drank wine and she had cider. I had wine. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. On another note, I can't believe you guys, we've been doing this uh, podcast for over a year. Our very first episode was April 9th, 2021. So here we are in May. So we've done this for a year now. That's just crazy. We love doing it. We hope you guys love it too. So today I'm going to be talking about gardening ideas for witches since it's beginning to look a lot like spring. Here in Georgia, it's actually kind of summery. Uh, we've already planted our garden. But warm weather is starting to poke its head up there up north, too, in a lot of places. So I think it's a good time to talk about witchy gardening. First, my drink. I was in the mood for a light drink today. So I was playing around with the La Croix flavors that I have at home. Right now, I've got that grapefruit, which that's not what it's called. It's called Pumpa something. But it is the grapefruit flavor. So I mixed that with a little bit of lime juice, vodka, and a jalapeno pepper with some a splash of the jalapeno juice. It's interesting. I like it. I, it's going to take a little bit of tweaking. The working name for it is Chaos Key. It's the Chaos Key. with well, subject to change, but it's, it's a fun, fun little experiment today. Oh, and before I start, I do want you guys to please check out my Etsy store that I've got up and running. It's Bats and Bobbles. It is at www.batsandbobblesinc.etsy.com. I have a lot of fun witchy stuff there. I'm starting to put up all the um, pendulums that I've made. I've got like probably maybe eight to 10 of those. I think I've only gotten one put up so far, but uh, more to come. And uh, we also have brand new C3 merchandise, t-shirts and water bottles that are for sale there. And if you use my coupon code, which is C3 Witchy Podcast, the number C, the letter three, I mean, <laughs> the letter C, the number three, Witchy Podcast, all one word, then you will save 10% off. I uh, wish I could send you some of this drink that I'm drinking too, but 10% off of the merchandise ought to, ought to be somewhat helpful. Okay, so the garden can be one of the most magical places in your life. The very act of planting, of beginning that new life from a seed is a ritual and magical act all by itself. Um, I think I've said before that I believe my dad's a witch. Well, at least magical, which the term witch is debatable, but he is definitely a magical person. And some of my best memories have been with him in the garden. He is an avid gardener and is a scientist as well. So he would cultivate his own plants and vegetables. His garden brought all of nature into our yard from the bees that pollinated the plants to the rabbits that tried to sneak the carrots from our garden to the birds that enjoyed the bird baths that we had down there. Um, it, it, wonderful, wonderful memories. When we tend our garden, we tend to our very souls. I truly believe that. And we also provide food and shelter for the local wildlife, like the birds and the insects and the amphibians, etc. The deer, unfortunately, in our yard, they really love our garden. Um, of course, there aren't any particularly rigid rules or any rules of any kind, really, for your witchy garden. Everyone explores garden magic in their own way, which is as it should be. And I find that to be an incredibly beautiful thing. So your witch's garden, it can be permanent, like you can do it every year, keep it going all year long. It can be temporary. It could be formal, you know, like you see in those estates on TV, or it can be casual. It can be complex or it could be simple. 
large or small. I mean, it can even be a small space like a balcony or a patio or indoors even. Uh, Ren's garden, which she she has gotten her garden planted too, and it's all on her little patio in her apartment. And it is just, it's a beautiful thing to see. It's full of these lush plants. She's got a tomato that's about the size of my hand. It's green, but it's there. Uh, so she's very excited about that. You can use your witchy garden space for rituals. You can uh, harvest the magical ingredients to use in spells. You can use it just as a solitary place, a place of peace and healing and renewal. Witch gardens also make excellent places for meditation and just quiet contemplation. Um, you know, the there are wonderful things that to be said for just sitting outside in nature. So where do you all start? Number one, you have a plan. You need to have a plan. So even before the frosts have stopped, many of us start planning and dreaming about our garden. And I wonder if this is something from in our DNA from the times when winter was so harsh that each year we wondered if we would even survive to plant new crops. And so even today, many of us gardeners do start planning when it's still cold and snow may be on the ground outside. So how do you go about planning? Number one would be a garden journal. You can use a garden journal all year long. Think of it as a garden book of shadows. You can also uh, make notes throughout the year for plans of the coming season. You can document the season itself. You can document what crops worked, what didn't work, where you planted things, because it's always good to rotate your crops to avoid pests, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to sit down on a cold, dreary day with a cup of hot chocolate or coffee, or in my case, coffee with Bailey's Irish cream in it, and journal. Journal in your garden book at, about your plans and your dreams for when the weather is going to be warm at some point in the future. Draw sketches of your garden beds with uh, notes about what you want to plant. Plan to plant things that you might need for spells that you want to cast in the future. Uh, for dishes that you might want to make in your kitchen, for your kitchen witchery, for spells that you might want to actually grow. I saw some websites that actually had spells that accrue, that's not the right word, but spells that come about, manifest as the plant grows, which I thought was a cool thing. What else? You can use your journal as a scrapbook, which is fun. Take pictures, take pictures of plants you want to plant, take pictures, of, you know, cut out pictures from magazines as to the aesthetic that you're looking for. Put those in your journal, take pictures of your actual garden, you know, even in the wintertime, a picture of that garden covered in snow to go into your garden journal. It's a fun thing to go back and look at. You can buy journals, or you can make one yourself. You can use something as simple as a three ring notebook. That's that's what I use. I've got a huge three ring notebook and I have separators in it so that I can look at, I probably can fit hmm, three, three, four years in at a time to, you know, I use those really big two and a half inch, three inch, three ring notebooks. Uh, you can even use a spiral notebook. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or it can be super fancy if you want it to be. Etsy has lots of really fun pages that you can buy and download, or you can actually buy physical uh, journals as well. Etsy is full of wonderful creative people. You can keep track of where you got your seeds, which ones produced better, which, which brand is better, which one was late with delivery, so that next year when you're sitting down and going, now where did I order those beets from? It's right there in, in your garden journal. You can also use your garden journal on the computer. So, you know, some folks don't like to handwrite things out these days, but you know, that's okay. You can do make folders on your computer and keep track of all your garden needs there. It's easier to cut and paste pictures and stuff in a computer sometimes. I actually do both. I have both a computer generated one as well as a physical one. You know, other things to think about in the planning uh, phase of your, your garden is, are you going to 
use your garden as a sacred space? If so, you might want to have an altar space. So plan where you're going to put your altar if you want one out there. Do research on seed availability, soil types, adaptability, um, cold hardiness, whether the herbs that you want to grow or the plants that you want to grow are toxic in any form. Um, it, that's especially important if you've got wildlife that comes into your garden or children or pets that might eat them. And you know, make note of this in your garden journal. You, you do need to know your own region for plants or research what can grow in your area. Like I love yellow raspberries, but they will not grow in my garden here in Georgia. But farther north, they are just delicious little delicacies that have no problem. But here in my garden in Georgia, I cannot get them to grow worth a darn. Think about your garden design. After you've done your planning in your journal and you've got your ideas, think deeper into what design, what do you want your garden to look like? Is it going to look witchy or is it just going to be a regular garden with witchy plants in it? You know, what, what is it that you're going for with this witch garden? You know, is it reasonable that you can have a pentagram shaped garden in your yard? Or is that something that your community might ostracize you for? We, we do get, um, discriminated against as witches. So is, if you're not out of the closet, you may not uh, want to be that open with your with your witchy garden. Um, you can make it look as witchy or as rudimentary or as elegant or as whatever you want. It's your garden. Do you want your garden to be mished together where the herbs and the vegetables are all just sporadically planted. I, I have seen some lovely gardens where it looks like the gardener just took a handful of seeds and threw it up in the air and they grew where, and, and there, that is a look. It is a beautiful aesthetic if that's what you are going for. Or do you want it to be more specifically delineated? You know, the watermelon's gonna go here and the carrots are gonna go here. You know, what is it that you want? You know, what is your, your aesthetic? You also might want to consider burying spell bottles or sacred stones in the soil as you plant. So you might want to, to think about gathering those ahead of time. Do you want to maybe use those things to form a pentagram under the soil if you can't do it above the soil where your neighbors can see it? What about casting a circle around your garden space before planting? Is that something that you wanna do? You know, a salt circle may not be the best thing when you're trying to grow uh, a garden, but there are other things that you can use for your circle, whether it's uh, the ethereal energy or something physical. What about water features? Are you going to have a koi pond, perhaps, or a, a fountain of some kind? Do you want statuary in your garden? Amazon and other markets have all kinds of statues that you can choose from. You can do Buddhas and fairies and butterflies. I've seen some pregnant Mother Earth ones that are just absolutely beautiful. Dragons, of course. Uh, you name it, you can probably find it. And what I've learned is that when you search for Halloween statues, you get a lot more. It's stupid to have to search for Halloween when I feel like witches are becoming more mainstream. But be that as it may, you can search for them and find them. Etsy has some, Amazon. There are actual garden centers that have them, that kind of thing. Okay, so what type of garden are you thinking about? Are you looking to do just a vegetable garden? Are you wanting to grow fruits like strawberries or lime trees? I tried to grow a dwarf lime tree here on my deck, but I could not get it to survive the winters here. I have no inside space that, you know, I would take it into the garage and it's number one, it still gets cold in the garage. Number two, the light really is horrible in there. So I have not yet figured out a way to make my lime trees uh, survive, but I, I want to. Um, as for the strawberries, we do grow those and those are quite tasty. My youngest, those are her very favorite thing in the garden of all times. And she actually has a fairy garden outside that we have planted the strawberries amongst. So she's very excited. Um, did you know, actually, I have a strawberry fact. A strawberry contains around 200 seeds and it is the only fruit that has its seed 
on the exterior part of it, which I thought that was pretty cool. So what other type of garden are you thinking of? Do you want to grow a poisonous herb garden, which I think is cool, you know, but you've got to think along the lines of what does that entail and how do you keep your animals and nature safe if you're going to do that. But I do think that's a cool idea. Um, do you want just an herb garden for your kitchen witchery? Maybe you just want to grow chives and thyme to cook with, that kind of thing. I think maybe a grape garden sounds quite lovely. I think that would be a witchy garden, don't you? Because then we can make wine from the grapes. Oh, I could have a, a witchery, a witchy winery right now. I don't think I need any wine, but anyway, that, I like that idea. Did you know that actually the first recorded process of creating wine was done by Egypt about 5,000 years ago? That was the first recorded um, instance of it. But there is evidence that grapes were being used to make wine as long ago as 8,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. And it's good to know that my love of wine is pretty much ingrained in my DNA from my ancestors. So I think there, there's a reason for that. So I came across other types of gardens that you might want to consider, and these are very clever. And of course, the links are attached to this. An elemental garden. You can use a garden, you can grow a garden that is for all of the elements. You can use a compass to determine the direction and plant air plants in the east and fire plants in the south and water plants in the west, earth plants in the north. And in the center, maybe that's where you put that altar that we talked about, or a, a meditation area, or a ritual area where you can cast spells, or you do your full moon magic outside. Um, or it could even be just a focal point. You can do this around a tree, uh, with the tree in the center as the focal point. You can actually specifically cater your garden to one of the specific elements. So, for air gardens, for example, for an air garden, you would want to focus on drawing in winged creatures of all sorts. And you can do this by planting flowers and herbs that butterflies and hummingbirds and bees are attracted to. If you want to attract, attract dragonflies, you'd have to add some kind of water feature. A bird bath is a perfect way to do that. And it also invites the other winged creatures, the birds to come to your garden as well. And Bird seed like um, and berry producing plants and flowers like, you know, the sunflowers, um, blackberries, elderberries, juniper, all of those things uh, attract flying creatures as well. You can include some nighttime winged creatures by adding a bat box, which I, I didn't even know these existed until I did the research for this episode. And I am now going to get a bat box for my yard. And as an added benefit, if you have bats in your yard, they eat those pesky mosquitoes that love me. I'm O positive blood. And apparently that is like the crack to mosquitoes. So, you know, we all go outside and I'm the one that gets eaten alive and everybody else is like, wow, there's no mosquitoes today. And I'm like, yeah, because they're all on me. Etsy has some lovely bat boxes, by the way, if you want to go look at those. I also saw something on Etsy. It's a bat balm plant. Um, it's like dirt clay balm that you plant and it grows th things that attract the bugs that the bats like to eat. I think it was called a bat bomb. Go, go look that up on Etsy. Did you know that bats can actually live more than 30 years old and can fly at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour? That's crazy. I wonder if a bat and a cheetah uh, raced each other. I guess the cheetah would win. Can't they go up to like 120 miles per hour or something? I'm not sure, but 60 miles an hour is pretty fast and a bat can fly that fast. Another way to honor air in your garden is through the smell. So choose highly fragrant, fragrant, wow, flowers and herbs and enjoy those, the smell of those as it floats through the air on the breeze. So gar an air garden, that sounds fun. So fire garden, use hot color flowers, herbs, and foliage, such as reds, magentas, oranges, yellows, that kind of thing. 
Include hot vegetables if you want to have vegetables like peppers and onions and garlics, maybe even some stinging nettle. Another way that you can honor fire in your garden is with a small fire pit or a chiminea. We had a chiminea that we used to love on our deck and now we've actually got a fire pit. I think you all have probably seen pictures of it on my um, Instagram account, but you can put one of those out in your garden. You can have tiki torches, you can have lanterns or candles or tea lights. What are those strings of lights called? The fairy lights? You can put fairy lights out in your garden. Um, tea lights in an empty mason jar are a safe option. Votives and tea, light, tea lights can be put in thick glasses such as wine glasses or martini glasses, which I would rather have wine or martini in my glasses than candles in my glasses. So there you have it. Moving on to the water garden. Incorporating a water feature in your garden is obviously, obviously the way to invite the magic of water to your garden. Um, a lot of people don't have space for one of those huge, you know, water features like we see on TV at those grand estates, but you can have a tabletop fountain. I have seen some adorable tabletop fountain. I think Home Depot has, has those, and I'm sure Etsy probably does too. I haven't looked. Uh, but yeah, it can be as simple as, an, as a tabletop fountain. And a bird bath is a, another way to bring water to your, your garden, a water element. You can do a large fountain or a waterfall or a pond, you know, the koi pond like I was talking about, or just a regular pond. Um, add some aquatic plants such as water lilies or horsetail. Those actually can be grown in a half barrel if you can't do a pond or a fountain. You can bring in the energy of water by incorporating blue hues. Blue is one of the rarest colors to find in plants. Um, you may also want to put purples, whites, and pinks in your water garden. Decorate using shells, starfish, sand dollars, mermaids, water nymphs, you know, the statuary of mermaids, there's tons of those out there. That's a great way to make your garden a uh, water garden. So earth gardens, obviously earth is pretty much um, already in a garden because you're outside and connected to the earth. So pretty much a regular, any garden is gonna be, have a lot of elements of earth in it. But you can include things like grounding elements to make it more associated with the element of earth. And grounding elements could include um, maybe a seat made out of a tree stump or uh, wooden willow branches and stick accents or, and furniture that are stick-like. Uh, rocks and boulders is another great way to add that. If your space allows, adding trees would be lovely. These could be shade trees or sacred trees. They can be fruit trees or nut trees um, or just a simple, your favorite tree out there. An abundant vegetable or herb garden is another way to incorporate the element of earth and the bounty of mother nature. Create walls of green all around your property, your yard and your balcony. Rin is really good at this with um, her designing that she does. She has a great talent of using living plants as decorating accents. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. So just keep filling your space with plants until it's green everywhere. This gives you not only, you know, a magical feel to it, but it gives you privacy as well and a place to do your magical stuff if your neighbors are a little against witchy ways. Add some garden gnomes and dwarves to honor the earth elements. Okay, so are you starting with seeds when you plant? Some people start with seeds. Some people actually go out and buy little uh, already germinated plants to plant. We do both. We start from seed and we, we do actual little grown plants. So if you do start from seeds, consider blessing or cleansing them before you plant them. Place the seeds on your altar and maybe say a, a spell or a prayer over them. My husband and I actually soak our seeds before planting, and this year we soaked them in moon water. I made moon water to soak them in. Uh, you could probably use crystal charged water as well, although you got to be careful. Some crystals don't do well in water, and some crystals probably aren't good for the plants either. Um, so 
research that before you do that. But moon water for sure, or sun water. Sun water is another uh, wonderful uh, item to, to help your garden grow. A garden witch sets her intentions with the sowing of the seeds. You imbue that energy into the seeds themselves when you hold them in your hand and you cover them with soil and you water them, that kind of thing. When you're planting, so there's a lot of varying information out there on when to plant as far as moon phases goes. So there are some people that say the best method and time for planting and for inspiring garden magic is on a new moon. A new moon is a great time for new ventures, opportunities, and fresh starts. It's beginnings. So that theoretically, that would be the time to sow your seeds. In very general terms, waxing moons, which is the time before the full moon, from the new moon to the full moon, are better, better times for handling above ground crops. While the waning moon, which is after the full moon going back towards the new moon, those are better for some of the root crops and doing garden maintenance like weeding and trimming. As for the full moon, many ancients believe that as the moon draws the tides of the seas, and I think I've talked about this before, it also draws up on the water, causing the moisture to swell up in the earth, you know, come closer to the surface, which promotes growth. And therefore, that the full moon is the best time for planting seeds. Put your intention into the process, whichever time that you think is right. Speak to the plants and the soil. Share your innermost thoughts. Allow your energy to amplify their purpose for, for being. Handle them with reverence and respect. These, these seeds and plants are going to provide food. Or if it's just a flower garden, beauty, they're going to provide for us in some way. So show them the respect and they will reward us a thousand times over with what they grow into. So what kind of things should you plant? What, what's a witchy garden? What makes it witchy? Well, I came across some really cool websites and this one talked about how about doing a moon garden. A moon garden consists of plants that flower in the twilight or at night usually releasing a very rich, fragrant, I am having a hard time with that word tonight, fragrant scent bordering on the intoxicating. Some are simply white, a border in the background as they stand out against the dark, but a moon garden is meant to trigger all of your senses and your imagination. With moon gardens, the goal is to use mostly white, silver, and gray flowers and foliage with the occasional splash of perhaps pale yellow, pink, or lavender that will cause the plants to reflect the moonlight and basically glow. Uh, give some thought to the fact that you will most likely make use of this garden at night. So include plants and flowers that are night scented and night blooming varieties. While nearly all night blooming flowers are white, not all night scented flowers are. So look for the palest color you can and those if you're going to use those. Now, night blooming and night scented white flowers include datura, moon flowers, night blooming jasmine, white morning glories, shasta daisy, uh, white roses, night scented stock, night scented orchid, white lilies, although be aware of lilies because even the pollen is poisonous to cats uh, from what I've read. Gray or silver foliage you can use. You can use Dusty Miller, Artemisius, including mugwort, wormwood, lamb's ear. I love lamb's ear. It's so pretty and so fun to, to feel. Lavender and dianthus. Witch balls might be a good addition to a uh, moon garden. Uh, moon Garden provides a beautiful and fragrant backdrop to your moonlight rituals in the summer. I mean, can you imagine being outside in the summer with this gorgeous moon go garden around you? And if you plant these lovelies close to your house, you can actually sleep with your windows open if it's cool enough and take advantage of the smell of those beautiful flowers um, as you sleep. Well, what about a goth garden? Okay. In some ways, this is the opposite of a moon garden in that you'll be searching for black, dark purple, and maroon flowers and foliage instead of the white, bright, light-colored plants. 
dark colored flowers include the black magic iris, raven girl iris, black magic rose, queen of the night tulips, black star calla lily, black bleeding hearts, black velvet petunias, black satin dahlia, black hollyhocks, chocolate cosmos, onyx odyssey hellbore, hellebore, black jack gladioli, gladiolus, Rohi's queen fuchsia, black knight butterfly bush, black barrow columbine, poke weed, which are blackberries and reds with red stems. Dark colored foliage that you can use is the raven's wing plant, the mystic dreamer dahlia, purple basil, black dragon coleus, dark star coleus, black coral elephant ear, black mondo grass, and this one that I can't pronounce that is Simifugia brunette. I'm sure I butchered that. Decorate your goth garden with gargoyles, weather vanes, miniature coffins, headstones, little uh, black iron accents, you know, the, the fences that you see like in Louisiana, the wrought iron fences, that, that has that feel, that gothic feel to me. Brand new black wrought iron planters and arches and furniture, uh, although they could get kind of expensive. If you want to do something less expensive, then you could go to thrift stores and yard sales and maybe buy outdoor metal furniture and then just paint it black. Um, be sure to get the kind of paint that is good for outside use, though. A bat box would also be a great addition in a goth garden, um, as are frog ponds and spider webs being left undisturbed. They're, they add a gorgeous touch. Herb gardens. OK, so you might want to just grow an herb garden. We use a lot of herbs in our practice uh, in general, and the kitchen witch uses even more in cooking. So the best herbs to grow in your magical herb garden would be basil, rosemary, thyme, oregano, chamomile, mint, lemon balm, dill, parsley, cilantro, tarragon, echinacea, sage, and lavender. Rosemary and mint are super easy to grow. Rosemary can be used for nearly any magical intention, love, money, healing, uncrossing, dreaming, purification, and more. Um, it also keeps away those uh, pests like mosquitoes. Mosquitoes don't, don't like the smell of rosemary. Mint is also super easy to grow and it grows in the sun and shade, but you might want to keep it in a pot or a container because it will take over your garden, which it has our yard. Our yard has that chocolate mint, which is lovely. I love it, but it has like really run rampant along the edges of our yard. A flower garden. I mean, who says you have to just grow food or herbs? Flowers are beautiful in, in, in their own right. So and we use many flowers and spells. I, the most common one I can think off the top of my head is the rose. I use rose petals all the time. And you can dry your own rose petals and things. Um, even weeds or flowers. Think dandelions. I'm still wanting to make some dandelion tea. Um, and I've got a few of them growing outside, which I need to harvest before my husband mows them down. Um, but there's nothing wrong with just growing a witchy garden for flowers. Flowers for your altar, flowers for your home, um, and they can be what other people might call weeds, which are still things that we as witches would have a use for, like, like dandelions. Okay, so after you've planted whatever it is you've decided to plant, which we, if you want to know my garden, we have vegetables is the main thing. So we've got vegetables, but then we've also got herbs and strawberries for my daughter in her um, fairy garden. And we used to have a cherry tree, but it has died. So I don't have that. And we've put up birdhouses and you know, Ren actually gave me a birdhouse that she made, which is beautiful. So it's in our yard. And I'm going to buy some bee houses for my carpenter bees. And I want some bat boxes um, for my garden. And we have planted mostly vegetables to eat, but in the front yard, I do have my daffodils and my tulips just for the beauty of them. Um, okay, so after you plant them, you need to spend time in your garden pretty much every day. You need to 
observe the plants. We you, There's work that you need to do in your garden to keep them healthy. You should communicate with them. Um, <laughs> communication with plants is definitely a witchy thing to do. It's a common practice amongst gardeners, and some people swear by that. There are actual studies done that say that talking to the plants actually does make a difference. You know, that study, it says that it boosts their health. There was one study that was done where they grew plants in a confined area like a greenhouse and then other plants with radios nearby. And the ones that were with the radios and the music did much better than the ones that were solitary and in a quiet space, which could have been a number of factors. Uh, but I, ju I just found that interesting. You can emboss your planters, like if you're planting deck plants, emboss them with, um, and your gardening tools actually, with runes and symbols. Uh, you could use tarot symbols. You can use, you can create your own sigils and put those on your planters and your gardening tools. Put quartz crystals and moss agate within the soil to prepare the area for an upcoming ritual, as well as to charge the garden bed for improved growth of the plants. Water the plants with water, preferably solar water to allow for maximum nourishment and growth, or perhaps moon water. Consider doing a full moon ritual during the growing season as a token of gratitude to Mother Earth for blessing you, us with the abundance and prosperity of our garden. Make offerings. If you have a garden um, guardian or deity, perhaps, you know, leave out offerings to feed and, and um, honor it. Think of, of ways to leave regular offerings that don't impact the wildlife that's out there. So like um, leave a shallow dish in front of your shrine if you have a shrine or an altar out there and feed it with magically charged water every now and then. It's nice for the shrine. It's nice for the birds. And the shallowness of that dish will make sure that animals don't fall in and, and drown. Um, according to legend, there were ceremonies for harvesting plants with magical powers. You should never use iron tools because iron interferes with all the beneficial elements of the plant. Plants should be harvested at night under the rising phase of the moon or right before sunset, sunrise, while the ground is still wet with that moon magic dew, the, the dew that has been charged with the moon moonlight. And most importantly, of course, the harvester should be naked in order to increase the likelihood of choosing the herbs with the strongest therapeutic uh, powers. I am pretty sure my husband would pretty much kill me if I decided I wanted to harvest naked. Uh, though I'm not sure who would be up at four o'clock in the morning or right before sunrise, other than other garden witches. However, did you know, and I did not know this until I did this research, that the first Saturday of May each year is actually called Naked Gardening Day. I had no idea. It's a thing. My, maybe I'll do it this year. Don't know. Probably not. My husband would kill me. Um, I would say that's an appropriate place to end this episode. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. You can find us at our website, which is www.c3witchypodcast.com. There you can find our episodes, our newsletters, links to our merch and more. You can also get to our social media from there. We have TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you like our podcast and want to help, come support us. You can find the link to our Patreon on our website, or you can go to www.patreon.com slash C3 Witchy Podcast. Any amount that you give would help us tremendously. Thank you to the patrons we already have. You guys are the greatest. We cannot, we could not do this without you. Um, also, leaving a review would be quite helpful as well. Please check out my Etsy store. I, as I said, we've got some new C3 merchandise. Right now, um, all I've got on Bats and Bobbles is some basic t-shirts, short sleeve shirts, and some water bottles, but I've got more to come. So go to www.batsandbobblesinc.etsy.com 
and check out all the other witchy stuff that I've got too. And if you use the coupon code C3 Witchy Podcast, all one word, then you'll save 10% off. So again, thank you for listening. And until next time, stay witchy, y'all.